Okay, so to start with, from a personal point of view, um, you know, I, I grew up during the Second World War, and my background is of Jewish immigrants from the Russian Empire, Lithuania, Latvia. My father was actually born in Lithuania. Um, my grandparents all came from that area. And uh, we lived in our own little neighborhood, uh, as, as is the case in South Africa, different communities, etc. So it was very Jewish. But we, my parents might have been mildly Zionist. They weren't. They were more secular, not terribly religious. I actually was quite a rebel as a kid, um, and it was because of the South African situation. I just abhorred the racism and the way people treated black people and so on. But there was the element of anti-Semitism that existed here, not just from Afrikaner with Dutch or German background, but you know, the ones who could be even more anti-Semitic were those of an English background, a British background. So one becomes a bit sensitive that way. My mother particularly, she had two female cousins who were in the Communist Party, and I kind of started picking up little bits in relation basically that these were lovely, attractive, um, quite sophisticated women. Uh, the one married a famous communist who became my mentor later. Um, but even as a teenager, I started reading books of Spanish Civil War, the Second World War, um, which brought me into a, a realization of how the Soviet Union had really been responsible for for the defeat of Hitler, which went contrary to what we had in our, our English-speaking schools here, which was all about Montgomery and the British and the Americans. So I, I was sensitive that way. Um, I, the reading helped a lot, but it was even anarchistic stuff. It was Arthur Kessler and this kind of material. Um, and it's really pre-Sharpel, and I'm only about 21 then, that I'm interacting more with black people through music and poetry and getting into Brecht and literature of this kind. And quite early on, I get a real passion for Bertolt Brecht, which begins to take me into the counterculture of Germany. Uh, against Nazism. So I'm uh, quite sensitive and I'm writing poems and I get a job in a... a, 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 a okay, sorry. I get a job in, in writing films, uh, scripts for a film company, which is quite a avant-garde thing to do in South Africa. Um, but the people I was interacting with across the colour lines happened to be more bohemian types, even amongst the black people. Um, Sharpville occurs and it hit me so fiercely that I suddenly realised you can't just go on having discussions and debates and reading, you've got to do something. And that's when I actually search for people who are now in hiding and running away out of the country uh, and so on. And I go to visit my communist cousin in Durban. She's like 15 years older than me. And um, her husband is now underground. He's running away from the police and organising um, from underground. So I'm not known to the security police at all. And they had all their lists and they knew everybody of the former Communist Party and so on. So it was great for them to have somebody they could trust and could be a messenger, which is what happened. And to cut a long story short, my understanding developed incredibly. And I used to sit with this, this um, cousin uh, through, through uh, my mother's cousin's husband, um, and he gave me such incredible insight into Marxism, into the Soviet Union, into the Second World War and what had taken place. And then Cuba was taking place at that particular time. So I was caught by the bug at that point and became very involved quite soon with the underground, with the ANC, with the Communist Party, with the armed struggle. Being young and very physical and active, they seized on me to carry out these military operations. Um, okay, I, th I think that's 
the background basically but having come from that Jewish background I was so interested to understand the rise of Hitler and how was it that fascism could come to to the fore in a country where the working class and the Communist Party were so strong and, and organized um, and in, in relation to that, it gave me a realistic understanding of capital, the class forces, um, how fascism ar arises and develops. Um, uh, you know, it was really into all the classics and debates which were taking place within the liberation movement as well. Um, I, once I'm in exile and working in Tanzania where there was for the first time I'm talking now 64 63 I was there and worked there a couple of years um, I made very good contact with the GDR embassy and there was a wonderful uh, ambassador um, who was subsequently with his wife murdered in in Uganda by Idi Amin by the way and the name will come back to me. I'm sorry, my age now, and I'm forgetting his name. Um, but I, I remember him so vividly. And he, and then this small GDR legation with just half a, a few people there, him and his wife and a couple of others, are making quite an impact on the liberation groups, which is now centred uh, in... Tanzania in Dar es Salaam and with good relations with the Tanzanian government and I can remember him saying how they were striving to get their work done and having to rely more or less on their own um, their, their own obviously ability but you know they didn't have many resources but they became a magnet for liberation movement people to go there um, a, a very big impact and they would give talks to to explain the origin of the GDR, the whole nature of the situation and what had brought the GDR into existence, what they were up against. And we immediately could realize that West Germany and the West just wanted to see uh, this, this young socialist country absolutely wiped out. Um, one began to realize how important the solidarity was we were receiving solidarity from them and they had few resources we began to realize that as liberation movements it was our duty to understand the whole nature of germany and now the gdr and its existence and development and you know within a few years i was deployed to london and i had the um the privilege to work with people like Yusuf Dadu, um, who incidentally, his former wife had married that German ambassador, in GDR ambassador in Dar es Salaam. Uh, she had been a German woman who was living in South Africa from before or just after the war and was an anti-fascist. Lessing, his name is Dr. Lessing. That ambassador, tall, bespectacled guy, bespectacled guy, very nice humour, always optimistic, uh, great sense of humour, and you know, always, you know, we must deal with the the, the, the problems, the contradictions, and so on. He was a great ambassador in the general sense. I'm talking now, not not in a formal sense, ambassador for a new socialist Germany. He really impressed young people like myself and had very good connection with the older people like Oliver Tambo, Moses Katani and, and the leaders from other liberation groups. But what I wanted to come to was to tell you that quite soon after I was in Britain and I was deployed there, we began to create uh, clandestine uh, connections with South Africa for uh, and recruiting couriers, uh, this book that I'm giving you, okay, International Brigade Against Apartheid, was was the recruiting of young white people, especially from the Western countries, who could easily go in and out of South Africa. And you know, I used to read 
books about the war, as I mentioned, including the Rotte Kapelle and these kind of books about how the underground operated. And it was quite amazing to discover that within fascist Germany, even after the onslaught against the communists, socialists and so on, there were still groups brave enough to, to operate. I know there was one that came more from middle class or bourgeois background, which was the White Roses. And I, I was read something about them. And, you know, these were the kind of books that one was reading and becoming very interested in. So I had quite a good feeling about German progressives and obviously communists, but progressives who were against Hitler. Uh, just a bit of a diversion. There were some Jewish comrades and some who I had recruited who even up to the time we were working with GDR and and and, and the allegations uh, from the GDR in, in Maputo and places who found it difficult, younger people who I'd recruited, some from Britain who were Jewish, who, who couldn't see the difference between a German, that no, no, Ronnie from Germany, I don't know if I could meet him. And I'd say, for goodness sake, don't you understand the difference it's like in South Africa? Uh, people for it against apartheid. It, it's just quite incredible. So quite soon, uh, I went with Joe Slovo to the GDO, which was my, my first experience. Um, and I would say that was about 1967, to solicit some support for training some of our people directly, people who, who would come from Tanzania and Zambia, to get them trained in clandestine activity in the GDR and also to benefit from their experience in terms of smuggling literature and carrying out underground work. Um, and it, it, it was fascinating. So that was the first occasion, uh, 1967 or so. And in going there, it gave one an absolute understanding of the extent of the solidarity which the GDR was providing. So we were receiving, and I had been trained in 1964 for a full year uh, with a contingent of 150 other um, comrades of our armed wing who had come out of the country like I had and been in Tanzania. Um, we subsequently trained for a year in the, the Soviet Union. And we, we understood the resources, the extent of the power of the Soviet Union and their resources to, to enable practical support of receiving people for training military and non-military uh, in the hundreds and hundreds, uh, providing weaponry and resources, uh, you know, just to quickly say, some of our comrades had trained in Algeria and, and Egypt and places. In one year, they had fired their weapons three times. In the Soviet Union, we were firing our weapons every day in practice, etc. They had those kind of resources. So, you, you know, suddenly here you know, one was in a small socialist country with this huge aggressive neighbour in every sense of the word in the Cold War and so on. Um, and we could actually see that there was more development taking place, even in 67, 68, than one was seeing in the Soviet Union. <laughs> and, and of course, one saw this later. Um, but it quite amazed me at the readiness that the GDR was showing to support us, and one realised they were also providing this kind of assistance to other national liberation groups. Because uh, while we were there, we, we encountered uh, some comrades from Namibia, from Swapo, and there was quite a connection because Swapo having been a German colony and the concentration camps which fascist, you know, German Empire, uh, the colonial power had set up, as we well know, the first concentration camps in the early part of the 20th century in Namibia, the genocide, etc. Um, so 
we were discussing the ability to train some people who we would send from uh, London. I already had come to realize that uh, Mac Maharaj, a really well-known South African, he had been uh, trained in the GDR in printing and using underground methods, etc., from early 1960, and had come back into South Africa to work in the underground in 1962. After Ravonia, he was arrested and he served 12 years in prison, had a very strong connection with the GDR. So one realized that they were already, even from 1960, they were taking through London some of our people to um, give them uh, training uh, in, in, in things like uh, non-military activity, but including clandestine and the publishing of underground uh, materials and so on. So it's, it's, it's very early on. I had the privilege of seeing the growth of the resources that were provided for uh, assistance to the national liberation struggle um, over the years, from the 60s right through to the late 1980s because of the Tetero example, where, as, as we well know, it's been written about and so on, where Tetero from 1976 became a centre in which this small country was providing six-month courses twice a year for 40 very advanced cadres which were coming from the ANC in Africa um, in, in terms of very advanced uh, guerrilla and uh, um, guerrilla warfare and underground clandestine methods including also security uh, preparation and intelligence preparation those groups were receiving their training in different safe centers in East Berlin and, and the environs, um, maybe four or five, half a dozen at a time, a uh, few times a year. Sometimes one or two people just receiving focused training and getting back into South Africa. So it, it had grown to that degree and I, my estimate is um, having been involved in that Tetro training group and going there maybe twice a year, over 10 years, that we had um, in 12 years, more or less, uh, 80 people, that, that's just under 1,000, which is incredible because this is very advanced training and highly sophisticated. Uh, one could add a couple of hundred other um, cadres from our intelligence and security departments over the period of that dozen or so years receiving training as well. I, I, yeah, I, I would say probably 200 or so, plus perhaps another 50 or so people specially selected from inside South Africa who were very sophisticated and advanced in their political awareness and activity in the um, emerging trade union and mass democratic movement of the 80s, who we would select and bring them to a place like Netherlands or Britain or France and from there send them into the GDR, um, often receiving over perhaps two, three months, very concentrated and focused preparation training in relation to underground organization, linking with, the, with public levels of organization, learning aspects of self-defense, security, sabotage techniques, etc. The other element of the training that the GDR provided um, was, as started with Mac Maharaj, uh, running an underground press, um, but then taking on for us the provision of our magazines and material and small booklets which were disguised with false covers, which were, say, Marxist tracts or the Communist Party's 
program, etc. And um, they printed for us the the uh, journals like the African Communist and for the ANC, their main journal, Sechaba. And this was all organized through London. So both the editors, uh, MP Naika was the editor of Sechaba, and later on Benny Turok, um, and uh, Brian Bunting, Sonia Bunting, uh, the African Communist, and she would be going back and forth to Berlin. Um, with the texts for printing, the arrangement for dispatch of the thousands of copies of those journals through to uh, London. Uh, you, you can imagine the, the extent of, of the uh, capital resources provided for that, totally dedicated to liberation movements around the world. Africa featured very much. So it wasn't just the examples I cite for the South African movement, but it was for the others as well. It quickly brings me to a point when Sam Nojomo of Swapo, their president, be became, when in Namibia becomes independent at the end of 1989, 1990 actually, um, in the GDR is Kaputa, okay. He's invited to federal Germany and goes to Berlin and yeah, again it's because of those former colony of Germany etc. They had the program worked out for him and he looked at the program and the dear man who, who showed his nobility and his understanding of principles, he said to the Federal Republic of Germany, he said before I start your program the first thing I have to do, which you don't have on the program, is to go to the eastern part of Berlin and to see the people who were assisting us for all these years and to pay his respects. And you can imagine how taken aback they were. But it's an example of how the GDR, in practical terms, of assistance, material assistance, to which we should add clothing for the military. Um, of course, we received uniforms from Czechoslovakia, Soviet Union, <laughs> um, Cuba, and GDR. And there were a lot of, uh, of our people who were in the GDR military uniform uh, in places like Angola and, and Tanzania and so on. Uh, we received food, tin foods, etc. Um, and, and civilian clothing as well. Right through this period from, you know, the late 60s, mid 60s, right up until the end, unfortunately, the demise of the collapse of the GDR. Um, one can go on giving examples, but I, I, I'm, I'm just projecting that so that people should understand, A, the extent of that support, which was also diplomatic, internationally so, and then in terms of the actual material support, the ideological aspects as well, because we had, for instance, at Tetero, they had a professor coming from a nearby university town, Mecklenburg, I think. And I remember the man coming and I would, when I was there, have interaction with him about what are the contradictions that the GDO was facing. It was quite interesting. Um, but the level of the theoretical presentation, the ideology and so on, um, the philosophy was really very impressive at a very high level because the GDR being so close to the West and having to interact and contest with the West had a much more sophisticated grasp of the power of capital in these imperialist countries um, to alert us to understand the extent of this. So it, it was very, very profound, this relationship. Um, you see, whether it was the GDR, Cuba, or Soviet Union, in the first place, one must say that we basically interacted with the authorities. 
who were wonderful in all those countries. This idea of Stalinists and bureaucracy and cold people, that was the actual opposite, which, which made us, you know, the first time you go there, you're interested about these people, and you find not only how human they are, but witty and warm and caring and so on. So that's the way, as a human being, you see through propaganda and the poisoning of one's mind. Um, we would certainly see the extent of the development taking place and that that development was absolutely so focused into the uplifting of people, of overcoming economic problems, um, in, even in a place like the GDR post the war and I can remember being taken around to Alexander Platz and the person was telling me, a young woman, um, how she had been mobilized um, with the people and voluntarily to come, the area where they were clearing up the debris of war was in Alex Platz. Um, so we could receive this information obviously in class and discussion and with officials the liaison who we interacted with but now to speak to somebody who was 16 years old in 1945 at that time and I'm talking about now with this particular visit when I was beginning to meet more people I'm talking about 1977 okay so it's like um 30 years after the war, and so this person was like 45 or something, more or less my age in fact maybe, um, and those stories were very interesting. Um, one could see more of the sophistication in terms of development, industrialization and light industry and so on in the GDR compared to seeing what we saw in Cuba and, and even the Soviet Union. Um, so, you know, we'd always be given some pocket money as a writer and someone they wanted to interview, go on radio. I always made some Deutsche Marks or rubles or so. So I had a little bit of money to spend. And going back then to my family, to young children in uh, London, and I would always find that the shops in the GDR uh, certainly had um, more improved goods than one would find in Moscow, <laughs> so not to belittle what was happening in the Soviet Union, but uh, you know, one, one could get the impression that socialism was advancing more in the GDR. Um, in terms of being fortunate to interact with some South African students while I was there, um, Yes, I would visit Tetro, but then I would have some time at Gusthuis under Spree, which was the party hotel. And being very free to go out into the city, to get into the underground and hardly pay, a, you know, hardly anything, a beautiful underground and go anywhere, was actually absolutely amazing. Um, but I had access then to meeting ordinary civilians the GDR and younger people or older, both elements were very interesting because the South Africans had these friends who they were going to universities with. I'm talking about the South Africans who were being sent there for that kind of training, some who intermarried with, with German uh, wives or husbands. Um, and getting that interaction of everyday life, you did come across both pros and cons, um, which made it interesting because it's impossible, you can't imagine, and we weren't naive, that the country could become advanced, being cut out of a, a, a an international market to a, such a degree, um, and, uh, you know, virtually sanctioned that there are these tremendous problems and having to have security vigilance across the border right there 
uh, eyeball to eyeball with a very aggressive, revengeist, powerful West Germany, which had taken into its uh, political elite, its, its ruling class, its judiciary and everything, former Nazis. We were well aware of that and could understand. Uh, and they would indicate this with quite a humour and not in a panicky way. I'm talking now the authority level about, well, we have to keep an eye on, on the big guy next door. So we had an understanding of that problem, which sometimes when we interacted with younger people in the GDR, weren't seeing that so much as their parents were, because I can think of a few really good friends, one or two I still have today living in Berlin, who I've even seen when I was lost in Berlin, um, riding around on a bicycle at the age of 75, a young w woman, the one who took me around to Alex Platz. Um, that they would be very interested in the freedoms in the West. They would be saying, well, you know, here can be a bit boring and at work we're so under uh, such structure and, and people a little bit wary of being critical. And then sometimes real gossip, which I would laugh at and argue with them, that they hear that Honecker uh, and the, uh, the rulers every day would be receiving fresh milk from Denmark. And because I was a Tetra and we were in the countryside and we were paying visits sometimes to particular farms, etc., we saw such glorious uh, farm animals, including cows being milked and the piggeries and so on. I could laugh and say, what is wrong with you guys? Be very careful about Western propaganda. It's designed to undermine your belief in the system here. You don't know what these people are up to. Um, I used to tell this to people in the Soviet Union as well. Um, so in, in terms of this, Further answering your question, what life was like, I, you know, I even went to a few parties, which were, I was taken by these South African friends or this particular woman, etc. I, I can remember this would have been in about 1984, 85. There was one woman who latched on to me when she heard, not that I was South African, because we'd, we'd give some um, cover story, not, you know, we undercover people, so it's like, no, I'm from England or Australia or somewhere. And this one woman had made up her mind that was from Australia. She came and she gripped me. And she was so excited. She said, please, please, you must marry me. I want to go and live in Australia. Just like that. And I could actually see she was like a little bit unhinged, by the way. But also a kind of petty bourgeois mentality. We had a wonderful South African comrade. Arnold Selby, who worked for um, the radio, GDR radio, and he um, had a big uh, contradiction with his wife and young daughter because they would tune in to West Berlin television. And he never in all his life in the GDR would he even look at an image on the screen unless it was the channel was the GDR. And he used to have very serious discussions and, and, and arguments, robust ones, uh, because they were attracted to it. And of course, he was so highly principled and understanding the machination of this false propaganda and this information. So one understood that living next to West Germany, it, it was impossible to keep aspects of this kind of propaganda out. And that inevitably, when you're building a new society, you have particular problems. And people can become very subjective about such things and begin to interpret things in a wrong way. I'm not saying that as time went along and we came towards the end game, uh, which affected so many people, um, that there were not 
deep contradictions, but that if one had a big picture view and an understanding of the international situation and what was now taking place vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union and the weaknesses, we could see this happening. I trained in the Soviet Union. Uh, for intelligence, military intelligence, in 1983. And I was quite shocked at the difference in the presentation that one would receive from our instructors. On the one hand, at the political level, they were sort of such, uh, sometimes quite silly, presentations about the international situation that I can remember when this one commissar or instructor was talking about the growth of socialism and asking how many socialist countries there were. I had quite an argument because although he was numbering, of course, Vietnam, but Laos and Cambodia, but not Mozambique and Angola. And I said, uh, you include Laos and Cambodia, which don't have the productive basis and kind of communist leadership of Vietnam, and yet you keep out Mozambique and Angola, which of course I, I wouldn't myself say is well, we socialist country, but you're saying that. And then this guy then proceeded to say, and what about, and he, re he mentioned San Remo in Italy. And I said, what are you talking about? And, uh, you know, one of these other little places where communists, you know, in these small little independent parts of France or Italy, had that year got a, a majority in terms of the council. And he was counting those. And, I, you know, I was there with a group of people not as sophisticated in understanding as me. And I had to say, look, for goodness sake, this, you, you're so giving the wrong impression here. Um, but, sorry, my, I had wanted to come back to the GDR thing, and, and it, it's something I left out. You see, at the intelligence level, there was a man called Marcus Wolf, great hero of yours and of the, the, the liberation movements, who had played such an important role in ensuring that our people, and I'm, I talked about those studying security or intelligence, received that type of training as well. And that was very sophisticated stuff, he, comparing it to the uh, Soviet uh, presentation as well. We got very good ideas and very sophisticated ideas about how to, um, how, how to collect information through Marcus Wolf, And he came to South Africa um, shortly, a few years before he died, that unfortunate death, to meet with people. Unfortunately, I wasn't av available, but Mac Maharaj was, and there was a little party that was given to him. So people throughout the, the uh, liberation areas, the na national liberation struggles, were, were very aware of the value and the extent, the camaraderie, um, the, the warmth of uh, the, the kind of um, support that we received from the GDR. Um, so coming then to the basis, the, 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 the communist ideological underpinning that we received in South Africa and that gave birth to this internationalism and the uh, alliance, the unity, which emerged after the Bolshevik Revolution with this establishment of a common turn. Um, right from the beginning, the whole theorization out of Marxism uh, of the alliance and the solidarity between the socialist countries and the anti-colonial struggle, and, you know, what we call the three detachments of the struggle, the working class of the, um, of the capitalist countries. In the first place, the socialist camp, the working class of the capitalist countries, and the national liberation movement, where there were big discussions. The Communist Party of South Africa were very involved in those debates from the early 
mid-20s and the consequence of those debates of how the formulation of anti-imperialist struggle, the anti-capitalist struggle, the alliance between socialism and the people fighting against colonial, colonialism um, and, and how, how to develop that unity. Um, out of this emerges the um, firm unity of, of such forces. The theoretical factor is vital in terms of what people from the so-called third world or um, developing world, especially by the post Second World War, there's the theoretical understanding and analysis, uh, as well then as of the support received materially, practically, in the struggle against colonialism and the collapse of the colonial system, the support then that's provided for the emergent independent countries such as Tanzania, Ghana, these examples that we've given, Egypt, etc. And in the hours of need, like uh, at the time of the, uh, the 1956 um, Suez crisis with um, Israel and uh, Britain, France, Israel uh, um, taking control of the Suez Canal and whatever. Uh, th these aspects, including economic uh, development and possibilities of these countries against neo-colonialism, are very key factors. And this underpins our understanding of what proletarian internationalism is and the unity that's required between the three detachments of the struggle. We go through the phase of the Sino-Soviet dispute, uh, which creates certain confusions at some quarters, but also greater clarity in others. Um, and clearly it's from two sides. The same comrade who was working with Radio Berlin uh, Arnold Selby, he used to speak with the South Africans and talk about his actual experience in the GDR. He was wonderful. He was an ideologue, he was a theoretician, he was a very practical guy with a white working class background in South Africa, trade union background as well. And he used to say, comrades, solidarity is a two-way street. It's not just that we come here from South Africa and we receive solidarity from the GDR or the Soviet Union. It's what we can provide them and they require this steadfast support, this alliance, this coming together, whether it's the NAM non-aligned movement which is progressive and anti-imperialist, um, which the socialist countries support, um, and don't simply see as neutral between two camps, but we must understand how we s must support them in the world bodies at the United Nations to break out of the isolation and the sanctions which the West is constantly attempting to apply, and how we must work and assist these comrades in Africa. They're um, their, their, uh, their legations are not simply there to give us support, but they need the kind of support from us to break out of isolation because we have our GDR comrades in those countries at times feeling very isolated. And we must make sure that liberation forces attend their events. They put on um, films for us. We must go there in terms of supporting a GDR National Day, etc. And incidentally, to just show the practicality and to come down to personal factor, I can tell you that gave you the example in the very early days of Tanzania as it becomes independent, 1990, 1960. Um, three or four, I, I think round about then, I think it's 63 already, it's Tan Tanganyika first. Um, but this is when Lessing is there, Dr. Lessing. Um, there weren't many, um, there, there weren't many 
uh, GDR embassies around the world and how we uh, supported uh, the GDR embassy there. By the time we now in the 70s or so, there are many more, and they are more confident, they have more resources. And I can tell you, when we in Zambia, um, the comrades from the embassy there uh, were giving us such support, we could go and visit them, and, you know, we'd be welcome there, etc. But I, I, we could use their phones to speak to our people in London or in France and in South Africa. And I can tell you that Tabo and Becky, no less, used to come to that, uh, the, the, the guy's home, so it wasn't the actual headquarters, the, the embassy, to the guy's home, and use his phone to speak with Winnie Mandela quite often, and long conversations, trying to direct her uh, in her activities. It was very touching, that aspect. So they were, they, they sound like small things. Do you think you could get something like that out of the British or, or the American or the French uh, embassies in those countries? You wouldn't even dream of asking for such its assistance, but would you ever be really welcome in those places? Obviously, as time went by and the, we were getting on top in the struggle, then they were now beginning to invite us to the embassies. We would only send people to go there who were from our intelligence uh, structures to keep very tight-lipped and to sort of pick up what was going on in places like that. But the, the question of the difference between what we receive from all the socialist countries and I've always pointed out how the GDR being really amongst the smallest um, was up there with the Soviet Union, with Cuba, unfortunately with China for this very long period of, of exile up until independence uh, in South Africa until freedom. The Sino-Soviet dispute had affected that relationship. But the GDR was absolutely solid right through all those decades of the 60s to the end of, of, of the 80s. The Western countries were working against us. They were supporting apartheid. Um, they were calling us terrorists. Uh, they were providing apartheid with impunity. It didn't get to quite the degree of the USA and Israel because apartheid um, embarrassed the Western countries and therefore they would put up some hypocritical mask in relation to that. You know, we know of um, Harold Macmillan talking to the South African Races Parliament in 1960, the winds of change are coming to Africa. But that was to encourage the apartheid regime, not really to reform, but just to begin to understand that things were changing and that if they went out of line, as they did with Sharpville, that there would be um, condemnation. But this was never of the kind that brought any real pressure in the practical sense, say, of boycott, divestment, sanctions in terms of uh, the isolation of South Africa, far from it, because South Africa sought an alliance with all those Western countries in relation to the bogey of communism in the Cold War. So, you know, this is where the regime here would then raise the uh, anti-communist issues in order to show that they were, like Israel is doing, a reliable ally of Western capital. The collapse of the socialist camp, starting with the problem actually in Poland with Solidarność from the 80s. I mean, even going back to the Prague Spring of 1968, it, uh, that actually affected me. I was very solid in terms of how we understood Soviet Union and the support, etc. But I, I'd, I'd raised, perhaps as a younger person, and it was in London with people you know, like Dr. Yusuf Dadu, Joe Slovo in the top leadership, I, I had been quite disturbed because suddenly we saw major contradiction and it wasn't so much a external intervention of colour revolution that clearly was coming from the, uh, the, the, the street level.
Um, yes, students very much involved, so I could see some elements of what I've been picking up earlier, just fairly recently before that in the GDR. Um, but it was quite disturbing to see such numbers, which only one saw in the GDR towards the end of the 80s, the Leipzig options, you know, that kind of thing. One always looked for Western intervention, which always was there. We know, for instance, now you must, one must understand history. If we're looking at Ukraine, how can one disregard, never mind 1990-91, but Second World War, the Ukrainian Nazi collaborators, Stefan, Stefan Bandera, and then the intervention of the United States in support of the Banderists in the 1950s to carry out sabotage. That never stopped. Um, perhaps in those periods of the 60s, we weren't so clear about the extent to which the USA and the West had been attempting to undermine the socialist camp. It, I was very interested in the writings of people like Kim Philby and others, being from the Marcus Wolf background and so on. And, uh, you know, you, you would read and kind of sort of toss it off as though it wasn't so important that Britain and America in particular had been parachuting people into Albania and um, Balkan countries as in Western Ukraine. Um, and you just thought, oh, well, this wasn't much of a problem. You know, a few kind of, a, a, a few kind of bandits, etc. It was kind of a, a paragraph in a book that you were reading. You didn't realise the depth that I've come to now, having really to understand the history of the Ukraine. So you know, when I say this about Czechoslovakia and the Prague Spring, I can remember in the big debates we then had in. London in the South African uh, 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 milieu, uh, our political milieu um, situation, okay, that the older comrades, Joseph Dadu and company, were, were saying, no, the, um, you, you must see the extent to which the imperialists are wanting to take over Czechoslovakia. And Palm Dutt, who was one of the outstanding theoreticians of the British Communist Party, he wrote an article which then changed my thinking, which was that um, Czechoslovakia was a, a, a dagger at the heart of Moscow. And he then brought into effect what hadn't been so obvious, um, the extent of what was happening with the GDR, the imperialists' intervention and finding groupings and collaborators of obviously always starting with spies and espionage, so that one was very aware that the socialist camp couldn't lower its guard and had to keep up a high state of vigilance and therefore security control, a la the Stasi, etc. And we know how these things are also exaggerated in the West, even in relation to, say, Stalin's rule. You know, the, the treatment they're giving Putin at the moment, equation of Stalin and Hitler are equal, Putin and Hitler are equal. It's very powerful that when you don't have a counter to that information when you're subject to Western uh, disinformation through their television and media at academia, it is very powerful. Um, so that factor one really has to take into account. But um, at, at the same time, there's the factor of to what degree, as Joe Slovo had written in Has Socialism Failed, which he wrote in 1991, um, the failures to really develop democracy amongst the people, and he's not talking about bourgeois concept of democracy, we're talking now about a Marxist Leninist concept of democracy, which you can only have if you can base it on real deep education and theory, understanding amongst 
the people and very much to start with amongst the layers of, of your own authority and party and then into the, 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 the levels of your people. We saw how the socialist countries made huge endeavors in terms of development of new pedagogy, new forms, education, understanding at school level. And I, I can remember from 1964 Soviet Union and visiting schools and being so impressed with the awareness of, of, of 15, 16 year olds and the way they were reading the novels and history of Western countries from Shakespeare to so many other progressive writers. Um, the interaction I, I had at times with not so much GDR because I found that the level of authority there, the leaders were very clued up. But in quite a number of socialist countries that it was it was not so deep. And especially I one should say this, you take into account the fact that so many communists had perished in the Second World War. And that I've I've studied Hungary more in terms of some of the books and the fact that my one son, who's a trade unionist, very left-wing in, in uh, the UK, is, his partner is Hungarian. And um, I came to realise something that Joe Slovo had said to me, because he was in all of the countries, even talking about the Soviet Union, that, you know, some of these people are not communists, Ronnie, like you and I are. And that troubled me initially, and I had to discuss it further with him. And it was this fact that post-1945, if you looked at a southern country I know here, Hungary, that there were very few of the pre-war communists who had survived, and their parties were quite small, and that there were a lot of opportunists or careerists, maybe some positive aspects to them, who came in to take up jobs but weren't the kind of real educated communists with a real understanding, which we see in terms of South Africa, the kind of people who have been joining, not just in our country, but in, in other countries uh, of the developing world, the national liberation movements in power particularly. So I'm talking here about from Mozambique to Angola and South Africa, where people come and, and get into positions in the parties, in the movements, uh, for not the, the, the reasons that the old-time Bolsheviks in, in all our, our, our countries that we talk about were involved. It's a very big difference. Um, th that's a question that arises for the socialist project. How do we build um, and um, protect the gains of a revolution which is under such threat externally that you have to have so-called, I say so-called, Stalinist measures in place to deal externally and even with internal subversion because they carry on with that. And you don't often have the Marxist Wolf type of sophistication. And I can tell you, He's very unique compared to the kind of people who I interacted with running intelligence in, say, the Soviet Union. But even with them taking into account what they're having to contend with, and we see what then happened to the Soviet Union post-1990-91 through Gorbachev and Yeltsin and so on, and then the neoliberalism in the Soviet Union, etc. So Slovo's pamphlet... Um, about the need for democracy within such societies and to keep that democratic spirit within the party becomes a big challenge in terms of rebuilding the socialist project. Um, has, it, has it got potential? Oh yes it has, because imperialism, uh, international capital, is facing inherent internal and unresolvable contradictions and trying to deal with them in very extreme ways, including in terms of how it's, especially US and the EU, de 
dealing, NATO, dealing with not military contestation from China and Russia, but in terms of their seeking to develop their economies on the world stage and their trading abilities and so on, which is so clear that the USA, given the nature of capital and corporate capital and finance capital and internal contradiction, when you examine the way they deal with their own people, their workers, their the ethnic groups, their black population, etc., etc. We see how vile this all is and how vicious they are in holding on to the empire and imposing their hegemony, keeping it imposed because it's under such threat. And under threat, we begin to see the phenomena and the developments looking into the future that they were shocked by the fact that when they blew the whistle, for support for sanctions and condemnation against Russia that the world didn't come running to their doorstep. And although they claim that, well, the majority, 140 countries in the UN vote their way, they forget to actually use arithmetic and tote up what India and China actually count as, what Brazil and South Africa and Indonesia and, uh, you know, even countries like Saudi Arabia um, who and, and so many in Africa who are refusing to kowtow to the Western line. Um, of course, it's very difficult to prophesy what this outcome is. It's a very bitter struggle. Uh, Russia is having to defend itself um, for obvious reasons in, in an existential way in the history that it's been through and the provocations from the USA and, and, the, uh, and NATO and its expansion. Um, so, you know, one would loathe to see the writ of Washington uh, imposed on the world because when we look at this, we see an actual cycle taking place. Is it simply coincidence that at this point in time, from the Baltic to the Balkans, along the very borders running along the Russian boundary, and all those countries which were part, say, for Poland, um, which were actually part of an axis under Nazi Germany and now under NATO. I actually say, apart from Poland, but if we look at Poland's history, yes, it came sandwiched between Germany and the Soviet Union, and then there was the particular pact. Again, a pact, not because Nazism equals Stalinism, but because of the geopolitics and how the Soviet Union and Russia was perceiving the way Poland was the dagger through to Moscow. But we're well aware of how reactionary Polish nationalism has been right through the centuries and how ultra-reactionary it is today as part of Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, particularly those Baltic states, Poland and then Ukraine. Um, but I, I'm just saying that what is it then about this axis and this alignment and the fact that I'm not saying it's exactly correct, but it's quite interesting that the axis under NATO takes on board not just so-called liberal bourgeois democracies of Europe, but the most ultra-right-wing neo-fascist countries from the Baltic to the Balkans, uh, the Caucasus, you know, the, the Black Sea, rather, from the Baltic to the Black Sea, and, and etc., Georgia and the Caucasus. But um, there is the same basis for this, and that's when we look at Europe, when we look at the USA and the battleground that Europe has been over centuries and including the two world wars, 
that it's focused east, especially by the central states in Germany and those of Eastern Europe, looking into the vast lands and the resources, world's richest resources of Russia, which from the time of, of the Swedes and the Lithuanian and Polish <laughs> empires uh, were looking in that direction. So, of course, we understand, uh, be it that Russia now is, is a capitalist country, but under this kind of clash, what might emerge because Russia is showing its strength and there is the alliance with China and then the, the developing countries of the global south, which are not meaningless, very, very important in terms of BRICS. And now that uh, we have Lula in power in, in Brazil, it, it gives it even greater progressive nature. Um, so there is a huge confrontation and what we have to bear in mind in terms of, say, South Africa's position and so many of the African countries and those in Latin America and Asia is non-alignment for us is a key factor that we won't be drawn in to the, uh, the axis of Washington and uh, Brussels. Um, and that the key thing that we remind everybody in the world is it's the crucial importance now is, is for a diplomatic negotiated solution, which the West and NATO don't want. They prevented Zelensky from that. They're putting the whole world at peril at the age of possible nuclear confrontation. So this is a very dangerous point in time and it requires the international solidarity of progressive forces in the world.